Lecture 23 Mythic Heroes King Arthur In our last lecture, we took a look at the hero Gilgamesh from the ancient Sumerian poem, and we looked at the poem both as literature and as myth. We also tried to match um, the myth up, the features of the myth up against the idea of the monomyth that we have introduced, introduced in Lecture 21. This time, we're going to do something of the same with what's pretty close to a universal myth, myth at least in the Western world, that of King Arthur. Before we say anything about Arthur, we probably ought to say a word about the Celts who haven't really been in this course much so far. Jan Puvel, in his book, um, Comparative Mythology, um, spends a whole chapter describing the migrations of the Indo-Europeans during the last millennium BCE. He says that the Celts seem to have kicked off all these migrations by moving into large areas of Central and then Western Europe. They moved into regions that today include France and Britain and Ireland and parts of Spain. About the same time, they were invading northern, northern Italy, becoming the country that Rome would call Cisalpine Gaul or Gaul over the Alps. And then they also moved down the Danube into the Balkans and Asia Minor. They were everywhere in that millennium B BCE. They sacked Rome in the early fourth century BCE, and they left behind them a lot of Celtic place names. Mediolanum is today's Milan, Vindobona is today's Vienna, and a couple of Rome's greatest poets, like Catullus and Virgil, for example, were of Celtic extraction. And St. Paul addressed one of his epistles to the Celts in Asia Minor, the Epistle to the Galatians. For today's lecture, we're most interested in the Celts who settled in the British Isles. When they arrived there, they superseded the indigenous peoples the ones who built Stonehenge, about whom we still know comparatively little. The Celts were on the islands when Rome invaded and then occupied much of what today is England, up to Hadrian's Wall in Northumberland. But then beginning in the 5th century CE, Rome needed its troops elsewhere and they started withdrawing them from Britain. And as the Roman troops left, then began the invasions of the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes from Northern Europe, who fought with the Romanized Celts who now called themselves Britons, for control of the islands. It's in the context of these battles that the name Arthur first appears in the records as a warlord who seems to have been pretty successful in invading, in leading his people against the invading Germanic peoples. Eventually, the Angles and Saxons gained control, and we know they won because England today is called Angleland. Um, and then when they won, they, dro they drove the Britons into Ireland, into Wales, into Cornwall, into Scotland, as well as across the Channel to join their fellow Celts in what became Brittany and France. And that's important for the Arthur story, since many medieval versions of the myth, myth come from Brittany rather than from England. To finish up this brief account of invasions of England, um, Angles and Saxons, having settled in, were invaded first by the Danes and then by the Vikings, and finally by the Normans under William the Conqueror in 1066. So when, in the HMS Pinafore, Gilbert and Sullivan have a chorus sing about one character that he is an English man, that means really that he draws his genes from many, many pools. The indigenous monolith builders, the Celts, the Romans, the Angles, and Saxons, the Danes, the Vikings, and the Normans at very least. That's worth remembering because nearly all of these peoples contributed something to the Arthur story. And later, the Germans would make some big contributions. And the myth itself, the story of Arthur, was embraced by virtually every country in Western Europe, even in Byzantium, which is not quite Western Europe, and the Middle East, there were versions. So that this became really very nearly a universal myth. And of course, to this day, the myth is still growing. In the 19th and 20th centuries, there have been enormous numbers of paintings and novels and movies and television specials and comic books and graphic novels and video games and musicals and works of archaeological or literary scholarship. There have been poems, there have been operas, not to mention societies for creative anachronism, and even one American presidency, that of John Kennedy, which seemed to many people to be a kind of recreation of Camelot.
When I was young, um, there was a comic strip in uh, my local newspaper. It was called Prince Valiant, which was set in Arthur's time. It doesn't appear in any of my papers anymore, but I do understand that it's still going on. Um, and then some years ago, we all remember this, Monty Python did a spoof on all the Arthurian material in their search for the Holy Grail. So that today, if you Google King Arthur, you're going to get thousands of websites of every imaginable sort. It suggests that the myth is still very much alive today and in fact is still in the process of growth today. Um, Thomas Mallory's Mort de Arthur, which was published in 1485, and T.H. White's The Once and Future King, which was published in 1958, and Marion Zimmer Bradley's The Mists of Avalon, which was published in 1982, still sell a lot of copies each year. And somewhere tonight, somewhere in the world, Lerner and Lowe's Camelot is playing and at the very end of it, it will send that young boy running off the set, told not to forget that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. How the myth grew from its beginnings as a Welsh and Irish myth to one of its great apotheoses in Mallory would make a great course all by itself. But we can note here that it seems to have begun in pagan mythology, but along the way, it joined forces with the Christian story about the search for the Holy Grail. Now, the Holy Grail was either the cup from which Jesus served the Last Supper his, to his disciples and or the cup that caught his blood when his side was pierced during the crucifixion. In some versions, that is the same cup. So there weren't two, there's just one. But in any case, the Grail is one or the other of those. So that makes this the first really, truly Christian myth we've looked at. Because in this myth, Arthur becomes the ideal Christian king. Then, this composite story was modified by French courtly romance, making it more or less the story that we all know and has continued on to this day. We could also make another whole course, I suspect, out of a lot of questions about Arthur. Was he a real historical character? And if he was, what kind of character was he? What exactly did he do? Was there ever really a Camelot, and if so, where was it? That and you know, hundreds of other questions could be asked and could make an interesting study all by themselves. We can't do very much with them in this course because we're focusing on myth rather than on questions like these. But there are two good places to go if you're interested in these questions. Um, one is a book by John Matthews called King Arthur and the Grail Quest, Myth and Vision from Celtic Times to the Present. The other one is Christopher Snyder's The World of King Arthur. Both are very readable and really good introductions to a lot of these questions regarding Arthur. Both of them are richly illustrated and both of them have good bibliographies so that they'll send you off in a lot of other places to start. For us, it's probably time to take a look at the myth itself. And what we'll be doing mostly will be following the myth as it's told by Thomas Mallory since that's become pretty much the basis of everything that's followed ever since. Arthur himself is the son of Uther Pendragon, who is the king of the Britons, and Igraine, who is the wife of the Duke of Cornwall. The Duke and the king had been allies, but the king's obvious lust for Igraine, for the Duke's wife, caused the Duke to withdraw to his own castle on the Cornish coast um, called Tintagel. And Merlin, the magician who is an ally of Uther Pendragon, is begged by Uther to help him get to Igraine. Merlin eventually realizes that his own plans could be, could be fitted to these, and so he does help him. He lures, first lures the Duke of Cornwall out of his own castle to defend another one, and then he disguises, changes Uther Pendragon into a perfect likeness of the Duke of Cornwall, and he goes to visit his wife. Um, she thinks, at any rate, that she's sleeping with her husband. She is really, in fact, sleeping with Uther Pendragon, who looks like her husband, and it is that night that Arthur is conceived. Later, Igraine finds out that her husband was actually killed earlier that night before her supposed husband came to her, so she knows there's been some kind of substitution. Nine months later, she bears a son, and then she marries Uther. Arthur, this was part of Merlin's plan, is taken away by Merlin as an infant, and he is raised by Sir Ector and his own son Kay. Uh, 
Arthur doesn't know who he really is until, until years later when Merlin finally tells him. Meanwhile, Uther lives only two more years um, after, the, after his marriage to, uh, to Egraine, and when he dies, the Britain's kingdom falls into the chaos of warring nobles and clans once again into a kind of all-country civil war. When Arthur is about 15, Merlin arranges for him to assume power as king of the Britons. This was a story that we know because it was made famous both by T.H. Uh, White in The Once and Future King and by Disney in the, the Sword and the Stone. In the story, there is a stone that has a sword embedded in it and the, the inscription on the stone says that whoever can pull this sword out will be the rightful king of the Britons. Many try, none can succeed in pulling it out. At holiday time, there is a huge tournament to which most of the great warriors and knights in the kingdom all come to participate, including Kay, Arthur's supposed brother. Arthur is still too young to be in the tournament, so he goes along as Kay's squire. When Kay is ready to enter the lists, um, either Arthur has forgotten to bring his sword or he's already broken one. At any rate, Kay sends Arthur back to the camp to get another sword. Um, Arthur can't find one, and on, he wonders what to do. His, his, his brother needs a sword. On his way back, he passes the stone, and he thinks, well, that one will do, and he pulls the sword out and takes it to Kay. When he gets to Kay, Kay recognizes the, the uh, sword right away and so announces that he is the new king of the Britons. Everybody's impressed, but they decide to give it one more test. They take this, the sword back and put it back in the stone and ask Kay to withdraw it. He can't, of course, and he has to confess that it was Arthur who brought him the sword. Arthur, at that point, withdraws the sword a second time, proving to everyone that he is the rightful king of the Britons. And many of the people who are there, many of the lords who are there to observe this, immediately kneel down and acknowledge him, the new king of the Britons. Many, on the other hand, don't, thinking that they are not about to be ruled by a country-bred boy, and so that they immediately fly off into civil war, and the country breaks up into civil war again. In the ensuing battles, Arthur becomes a, a warlord. He proves an effective leader, and he eventually subdues all of those lords who fight against him. Once he has the kingdom sort of organized and pacified, he announces the creation of the round table. It's round, as we all know, because everyone sitting around it is equal. There is no head or foot of the table. And then the round table itself comes to represent everything good about chivalry. It's about protecting the weak. It's about serving one's king and one's lady. It's about upholding the right. Over time, most of the knights who sit at that round table generated huge cycles of stories of their own. Meanwhile, the French added to the story the character of Lancelot and his affair with Guinevere, Arthur's queen. Lancelot, of course, generated another whole cycle of stories of his own, but almost all of them slowly gravitate toward the moment when he Arthur and Guinevere become one of the most famous love triangles in all of history or mythology. They all love and respect and admire each other, that is Lancelot and Guinevere and Arthur, which makes the conflicts within their relationship more tense and agonizing because each one of them has to deal with inner conflicts at the same time. Members of the round table eventually begin to understand what's going on, and when they understand what's going on between Lancelot and Guinevere, they bring the, the matter to Arthur's attention. In almost all the versions of the story, we have the sense that Arthur already knew that something was going on, but hesitated to do anything about it because he loved both of them so much. As long as he keeps his eyes half closed, he doesn't have to notice. Once his knights have brought it to his attention, he has to act. He has to bring uh, Guinevere to trial, and in the trial, she is, of course, condemned to death for heresy. Lancelot rescues Guinevere as everybody seems to have known that he would at the last moment so she isn't she isn't c condemned to death but in the process um, several innocent knights are killed by Lancelot he doesn't intend to but he winds up killing some innocent knights and from that moment on the round table is no longer unified but it begins to split into into factions in a subplot meanwhile there are lots of meanwhiles in this story Morgan Le Fay, who is Arthur's half-sister, she is the daughter of Egraine and her husband, Cornwall, um, who is a kind of magician herself, um, seduces Arthur and conceives a son by him. 
The son is Mordred, who from his birth will reflect his, own, his mother's hostility toward Arthur. So that when Lancelot returns Guinevere to Arthur and then retires to his castle in France, and then Gawain talks Arthur into attacking Lancelot there in France, and Arthur leaves the kingdom, Mordred takes advantage of Arthur's absence to take Guinevere captive and to declare himself king of the Britons. Arthur has to withdraw from his siege of Lancelot's castle, and he comes home to the worst threat he has yet faced. Meanwhile, <laughs> there's another meanwhile, there are a lot of meanwhiles in this story, the Knights of the Round Table have had a vision of the Holy Grail. The Grail began as a separate cycle of stories and was later incorporated into Arthur's. The background story of the Grail is Luke 23 in the New Testament, where Joseph of Arimathea takes Jesus' body down from the cross and puts it in his own tomb. Tradition gave possession of the grail, that is that cup, whether the one that was used at the Last Supper or to catch the blood of, of Christ at the crucifixion. Tradition gave possession of that grail to Joseph, to that Joseph of Arimathea. In the Britain tradition, Joseph then brought the grail to, to Britain with a fellowship of believers. And he eventually leaves the grail in charge of a family of guardians known either as the rich fishers or the fisher kings. He also is said to have built the first Christian church in England at Glastonbury, and there he planted his staff, which grew into a holy thorn tree, which is either still there or at least a facsimile of it is still there to this day. The guardians of the Grail, this fellowship that Joseph of Arimathea brought to Britain, keep their treasure in an elusive, mysterious, hidden castle. But one of them, down, one of these guardians down through time is maimed and this is perhaps a, a, a remnant of Celtic lore. Since the king is the land and the land is the king, the land can't, can't flourish until the king is cured. The king can only be cured when someone finds the castle, enters it, when the grail reveals itself, and the quester knows the proper questions to ask. In order to do this, the quester must be pure of heart and worthy of the vision. That myth of the Fisher King is worthy of another whole course, but a couple of references here might be useful. Jesse Weston, in a book called From Ritual to Romance, partly inspired T.S. Eliot to write The Wasteland, in which the Fisher King is a central character. And in 1991, Terry Gilliam produced a movie called The Fisher King, starring Robin Williams and Jeff Bridges, in which, in a contemporary setting, a figure like Parsifal, in the Arthurian story, seeks for redemption in a quest for the Holy Grail. In the French version of this part of the story, which has yet one more complication in it, a really interesting one, I think. In this one, those keepers of the Grail have a long, long line of descent, which leads eventually to Elaine, Lady Elaine of the Arthurian story. In, some, in this French version, Lancelot is also descended, if, not, if we can't say quite directly from Jesus, he is at least direct, directly descended from the house of David, which is the same lineage as, as, as Jesus. So when in the Arthurian story, a liaison occurs between Lancelot and Elaine, Lancelot sleeps with her one night under the mistaken impression that she is Guinevere, and a child is born, that child is Galahad, that child Galahad thus combines in his own blood both the bloodlines of the keepers of the grail and the bloodlines from what Jesus himself came. And this whole idea, as you recognize, provides part of the theory theoretical background for uh, Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. So as we said, King Arthur is still everywhere. The grail story itself seems to have been considerably older than the coming of Christianity to Britain. The oldest Britain accounts that we have include stories of ancient kings going to the underworld and they're capturing and bringing back a kind of magic cauldron that bestows the boons of health and food on anyone who approaches it. The Christians seem to have simply imposed, superimposed their grail story on top of this one, and thus the two coming together made up this really complicated story. But back to our, back to our story. Um, the grail appears at King Arthur's court, and it fills everyone at court with joy and amazement. Then it vanishes. And when it vanishes, many knights vow to go in quest of it. The stories of most of their quests are stories of failures, and many knights who leave on this quest never return to Camelot. Eventually, Galahad, 
Percival and Bors, with various kinds of help, succeed, and Galahad is able to cure the maimed Fisher King and restore health to the blighted country. Galahad is then totally absorbed in the Grail's mysteries, and he is assumed directly into heaven. Percival becomes a hermit, and Bors is the only one of the three to return to what this time is a much diminished Camelot. In some versions, Percival is the one who succeeds, and in the German version, as we know, he becomes the central character in Wagner's opera, Parsifal. Well, the end of Camelot and the Arthur stories are told in the diminished world of the end of the Grail quest. Many of the knights have died. Parsifal has become a hermit. Lancelot now lives in France. And by this time, many of the younger knights who still are in Camelot weren't there for the building of it. They've known only its indulgences. They've known its luxuries. And so that they form a party which gathers around Mordred as we're pre preparing for the last battle. By the time the last battle occurs, Arthur has only a handful of the original Knights of the Round Table to defend the realm against Mordred and his allies. The last battle takes place at a, at a place called Camlan. Um, Arthur tries to make peace, but it fails. And by the time that day is done, um, almost every knight on both sides of the battle has fallen. Arthur kills Mordred, but then he is severely wounded by Mordred in, in the battle. And Arthur has Bedivere, one of his last surviving knights, throw his sword Excalibur back into the water from which it came. And then that marks the sort of end of the earthly story of King Arthur. Arthur ends the story by boarding a mysterious ship which bears four queens, one of which is the enigmatic Morgan Le Fay, and then he sets out for Avalon, where he may have died or he may be waiting for the time of England's greatest need when he will return. He is thus, as T.H. White called him, the once and future king. By the time this story got to Mallory in 1485, it had been a long time growing, and as we've seen, it has been going strong ever since. Scholars by now have tracked down almost every single episode of the story and can tell us where it came from and when it was added to the central corpus of the myth. Uh, Christopher Snyder, in the book I mentioned earlier, does some of this, and it really makes an interesting study in itself to watch how this little kernel grows slowly, 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 until it finally becomes the full-grown myth. The result is, by, this is so much a process of accretion, the result is that the Arthur story is a real treasure house of heroic myth motifs. It's a kind of textbook example of the monomyth. In the broadest terms possible, Christian mythological systems were imposed on much older materials, primarily Celtic in origin and dealing with the life of the Britons in England before the coming of the Romans. Joseph of Arimathea provided that link, and that made the Holy Grail the perfect object of a heroic quest. Galahad and or Percival go through all the steps of the quest as we've outlined them, the call, the departure, crossing the threshold, receiving supernatural aid, combats with monsters and demons and temptations, before achieving the boon which can cure the blighted land by curing the maimed king. In Arthur's own part of the myth, there are many more motifs. His conception and birth, as we've noticed, occur under unusual and partly miraculous circumstances, as is supposed to happen with a hero. It also happens at a time when his people are in great need, and that's another one of the criteria for, for the birth of a hero. He's then spirited away to be raised by foster parents. We've seen this is part of the motif, one of the motifs of the monomyth. The foster parents with whom he's raised are not precisely commoners, but they're well beneath the social standing of the crown prince. The dangers that beset the young man, young Arthur, as he's growing up, come not from his own father, because as we said, his father dies two years after Arthur is born, but the dangers come from the warring nobles who don't want Arthur to be king and would kill him if they could. So he's hidden away until Merlin is re ready to reveal him. He has a series of youthful exploits, the most important of which, as we've noticed, is pulling the sword from the stone and thus declaring himself king of the Britons. And then from there on, he engages in a lifetime 
of heroic achievements against other knights, against monsters, against giants, against temptresses, against obstacles, against all sorts of temptations. He achieves the hero's apotheosis, as it was outlined by Lemming, at the end when he returns to Avalon on a magic ship. We don't know quite what Avalon means. It might be an anglicized version of a Welsh word, Anwen, which is a, a kind of paradise where fallen heroes live on as immortals, maybe a little bit like the uh, Norse Valhalla. Or in some versions, um, Avalon is described or portrayed as an isle of women, and that would make sense too because it explains the four queens who come to take him away. And like Jesus, Arthur may return again when the, when the need is great and the time is right. There are lots of other mythical elements in the story as well. Merlin is probably descended from a mad prophet tradition in Ireland and Scotland, and there may even be something of the druid about, uh, about Merlin. He's taken out of the story by a femme fatale in the person of Vivian, who's one of his own students with whom he becomes smitten, and she winds up turning his own magic against him and putting him into a kind of paralysis or sleep, a kind of living death. He might be able to come back someday too. Morgan Le Fay and Guinevere are probably, scholars have decided, descendants of ancient Celtic goddesses themselves. And Sir Gawain spun off a whole series of his own stories, including most famously an encounter with the Green Knight, whose head can be cut off, but which always miraculously reattaches itself. And again, scholars have decided that this is probably an old vegetation myth, like the Ojibwe one we looked at in Lecture 17, in which once kills and then regrows the corn spirit. This green knight must be some kind of spirit very like that. The, the, the meanings of this myth could fill up another course. Um, it has been given so many different turns and so many different readings. I will just mention two that I think are interesting. The first one is that when Lancelot is added and made the lover of Guinevere, that gives a focus to the story that has been the springboard for most modern versions of the story, which has, as we see, a love triangle at the heart. Eugene Vanover, um, in, who is an editor of a collection of, of uh, Mallory stories, says this about that moment in, in the story. It is not the advent of the grail that henceforth accounts for the downfall of Arthur's kingdom, but the interplay of emotions which reveals with increasing intensity and clarity the harmony that might have been and the irrepressible forces bent on its destruction. The action springs from the clash of the two most noble forms of love and loyalty, the blind devotion of the knight lover to his lady and the heroic devotion of man to man. And the important thing about this is, what Vannevar is saying is that the duty to one's lord and the duty to one's lady are the two most important duties in chivalric knighthood. And they both are equally important. It is difficult, impossible to make a choice between them. It isn't as though you can put one on top of the other. Both of them are equally important. So he concludes, the task of the novelist is to show that there is no conceivable choice between them and so make us understand the magnitude of the drama enacted by the now familiar characters Lancelot, Gawain, Guinevere, and Arthur, all cast for the first time in profoundly tragic parts. It's been suggested, and perhaps it's true, that by focusing so much on this triangle at the heart of the story, we have in some ways reduced the mythic dimensions of the story by making it so very human. But that has been a source of an inexhaustible source of retellings, each of which manages to approach the triangle from a slightly different angle of vision and to emphasize a certain different aspect of it. The other way of reading it, which again I think is really intriguing, is one that's suggested by Felicity Ritty in a, uh, an article called Contextualizing Le Mort de Arthur. Um, what she says is that the Arthur myth solved a problem in history for the Britons who in the long run lose their battles to the Angles and Saxon, Saxons despite the efforts of their own great hero Arthur. Arthur never loses a battle to the invaders, but the larger history can't be changed. You can't send the Angles and Saxons back to Northern Europe because they wind up staying, they wind up winning. So that Arthur turns out to be defeated not by them, but by internal forces. 
He wins all his battles, but his people lose the war. Eventually, the Britons have to leave for Wales and Cornwall and Brittany, which leave the doors open to the invaders. It's the death of Arthur which allows all this to happen. His premature death allows his enemies to win and the invasions to occur. So the death of Arthur is the point of the story, and that's why, says Reddy, so many versions, including Mallory's, are called the death of Arthur. It, in a way, she suggests that these, th this may be a little like stories that Native Americans might tell about their own heroes, in which a brave warrior might win a string of brilliant victories over invading white people, but then he dies before he consolidates his victories. History will then go on. The story can't send the whites back to Europe any more than the Britons can send the Angles and Saxons back home. That's not the way history went. And so Arthur becomes the king who never lost a battle but who dies in a tragic way that allows history to go on as it does. One day he may return, this time to rewrite that history. Next time we'll take a look at one more heroic myth. This one, the Greek story of Jason and the Argonauts on their quest for the Golden Fleece and all that happens to them on their quest and on the way back home. With it, we can perhaps add another detail or two to our idea of the monomyth. That's next time.